Four Quarter Unit 3. We are God's Artwork. Lesson 11. Christ is Wisdom. Our scripture lesson today comes from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. The church, which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. That's Ephesians chapter 1, verse 23 of our lesson. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above any ruler or authority or power, or leader, or anything else, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere with himself. Did you know that the outward working of the Ephesian church's faith is what draws Paul's praise? And you'll find that in verse 15. Indicating that their faith had catalyzed a deep-rooted shift in their understanding of reality and expressing itself naturally in new behaviors. And you'll find that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, compared to Luke chapter 13, verses 18 through 21, for a pervasive life change in the kingdom of God. That Paul continues to place the Ephesians within the whole of salvation, praying for a spirit of wisdom, literally echoing Old Testament themes, particularly from Moses. You'll find that in Exodus 28, verse 3, 31, verse 3, 35, verse 31, and Deuteronomy chapter 34, verse 9, and also Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, which the early and modern church read as messianic compared to Luke chapter 4, verses 18 through 19. That the love for which Paul praises the Ephesians is clearly an active love, not simply an attitude. Paul's concept of love frequently carries themes of social justice, compassion, and life shared together. You'll find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, and compare it to compare to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, and Acts chapter 2, verse 42. That Paul again settles on faith, hope, and love. That's in verses 15 and 18 of our lesson today. Echoing 
1 Corinthians 13, also 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, chapter 5, verse 8. Paul's prayer is couched primarily in the inner expressions toward oneself and God, but this is only because it is his introduction of main themes that he will explore in the letter and often in their outer expressions toward others. That Paul's description of Jesus in verses 20 to 23 of our lesson brings full circle the messianic promises explored in earlier units, particularly prophecies of the messianic king. You find those that in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 5, 49, verses 10 through 11, the Davidic promises of 2 Samuel, chapter 7, and John 3, verses 14 through 18, 16, verse 14 through 15, and 28 and 17 verses 1 through 5. Our historical biblical background. In the book of Revelation, there are seven letters written to seven churches. You'll find that in Revelation chapter uh, chapters 2 through 22. The letter to the church in Ephesus was written first because of the city's prominence in the region and because the city of Ephesus had one of the greatest seaports of the ancient world. It was located on the coast of the Aegean Sea in Asia Minor and was the capital of industry and commerce for the region. Today, the once great harbor no longer exists because the land has been filled in with silk and today the ruins of the city are located about six miles from the coast of the Aegean Sea. Ephesus was a city with a population made up of people from around the Mediterranean world and it was known for its magnificent architecture which was so splendid that it rivaled even the architecture of Greece. Its chief temple was dedicated to the worship of the goddess Diana and was one of the seven great wonders of the world. Ephesus was home to many wealthy aristocratic people. The city was noted for its schools of philosophy and rhetoric, making it a center of education. Ephesus was at the center of paganism and idol worship, especially the worship of Artemis and Diana. You'll find that in Acts chapter 19, verses 27 and 28. And the people had a reputation for being very superstitious, immoral, and fickle. As mentioned uh, last week, the church in Ephesus was one of the most notable churches of the first century. And next to the church in Corinth, it is among the most well-known congregations of the ancient world. One of the most beloved and important Christian priestesses and letters was written in, to the church there. The letter, meaning the church of Ephesus, the letter of the apostle Paul to the Ephesians. Now, throughout verses three through 14, Paul has pointed to the great panoply of spiritual blessings that we have received through faith in Jesus Christ. 
And this passage, as with the previous passage, is a single sentence in the Greek text. In verses 15 through 23, Paul turns his attention to prayer and the great manifestation of God's power when he raised Jesus from the dead. In these verses, we have one of the greatest prayers of the Apostle Paul, and he lays the foundation for establishing that the church is not only the body of Christ, but is the fullness of manifestation of Jesus Christ in the world. And that's in verse 23. A note, the most difficult thing to get the saints of God to come together and to do is pray. Prayer is our greatest spiritual weapon, yet it is the least used weapon by the corporate body. Great things begin to happen among God's people when we pray. The Bible is full of examples of men and women who knew the power of prayer. One such giant of the Christian faith was the Apostle Paul. Prayer is the greatest spiritual weapon at the church's disposal. Our lesson is divided into three paragraphs. Paul's thanksgiving for the Ephesians, verses 15 and 16. Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, verses 17 and 18. And Paul's praise for the greatness of God's power, verses 19 and 23. He, meaning Paul, began with a word of thanksgiving for the faith and the love that the Ephesians had shown to all the saints. As you read Ephesians, you will notice that Paul's prayers were not haphazard, occasional outbursts, but were directed at those who he had given spiritual birth. And as often as he thought of them, he prayed for them. You will also notice that in the writings of Paul, love is not just a passive emotion without any corresponding practice, rather a linchpin that binds the believer to the will and purpose of God. And you'll find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, and compare it with John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. You will notice that throughout the book of Ephesians, Paul holds a prayer in various ways. It is doctrinal, verses 17, through 19, theological, back chapter 3, verses 14 through 19, and practical, chapter 6, verses 18 through 20. And he described the greatness of God's power was manifested through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's chapter in our lesson today verses 19 through 20. And Jesus was not just raised from the dead, but raised with power and authority that transcends every other rule, authority, power, dominion, and name, both now and in the age to come. God the Father has subjected all things under his feet and made him to be Lord over the church. Let's explain. Verses 15 and 16 begin a long single sentence where Paul indicates that he had been praying for the saints in Ephesus, and the word wherefore sets the stage 
for what Paul was about to write next and points back to what had been previously stated in verses 13 and 14. Paul had received a report that the Ephesians had heard the truth of the gospel, believed and were sealed with the Holy Spirit. And although we are not told when he received the news, how or from whom he received the report, we must remember that several years had passed between Paul's first and second visits to Ephesus, and to say nothing of the time that had elapsed when he eventually wrote this letter. Curtis Vaughn, in his book Ephesians Bible Study Commentary, noted that to assume that Paul did not personally know the Ephesians is to read too much into the text. Paul often commended the churches for the positive reports he received about them. I find that in Colossians 1, chapter, uh, verse 4, Philemon, chapter 5, Romans, chapter 1, verse 5, and compared to 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 10 through 17. The Ephesians had demonstrated their faith in the Lord Jesus and that their hearts were filled with love for all the saints. And love for each is the one virtue that Jesus said would distinguish his disciples. John chapter 13 verses 34 and 35. In their acknowledgement that Jesus is Lord pointed to their submission to being his disciples, Philippians 2.11. Paul made it clear that he was in constant prayer for them in their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 16, he reminded them that they were always the object of his prayers. Colossians 1 and 9, Romans 1 and 9, 2 Timothy 1, 3, 1 Thessalonians 1 and 2. And the greatest witness of the people of God to the redemptive power of God is love for the saints and faith in him because our love for each other reveals the depth of our faith in the transformative power of God. Verse 17 says that God is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, John 20, verse 17. And his glory reflects his splendor, majesty, and power. First Chronicles 29, verse 11, Psalm 24, verse 7 and 10, Psalm 29, verse 3. Paul begins his petitions on the Ephesians' behalf in verse 17 and continues into verse 18. First, that God would give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation. You may ask, what does Paul mean by the spirit of wisdom and revelation? In his book, Ephesians Bible Study Commentary, Vaughn says, the spirit of wisdom is a disposition that enables the believer to comprehend divine truth. And revelation is translated from a Greek word that means to reveal what has been hidden. Some interpreters believe that this is a reference to the work of the Holy Spirit who fills the heart and mind of the believer with divine truth and comprehension of his will. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 2 Luke chapter 21 verse 15 Ephesians chapter 3 verse 3 and Colossians chapter 1 verse 9 
ask, what is the purpose of this spirit of wisdom and revelation? Well, it has but one goal, so that they would have knowledge of him as he is revealed in the word of God. And second, Paul prayed that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened. Enlightened has in it the idea of illumination. And Paul wanted the believers in Ephesus to have spiritual eyes so that they could see the manifestation of God's power and comprehend the blessed hope we have in Jesus Christ. Psalm 119, verse 18, Luke 24, verse 45, Titus 2, verse 13, and compared to 2 Kings verse six, chapter 6, verse 17. Did you know that it is possible to be saved and not see the hand of God at work in the life of the local church? Remember, Satan can dull the senses and blind us to God's awesome power. Hebrews 6, verse 4, and chapter 10, verse 32. But hope is one of the words often used by Paul to describe the believer's expectations for the future with Jesus Christ. Curtis Vaughn says, the hope of the Christian springs from the calling of God, and believers have a holy calling, and this calling is for God's purpose, and the riches of the glory in the saints have been interpreted to mean that the saints are God's inheritance, each being precious in his sight. The third and final petition in Paul's prayer begins in verse 18. And in this part of the prayer, Paul turned from intercession to praise because he wanted the Ephesians to recognize how exceedingly great the power of God works in those who believe. And Paul uses four superlatives in his description of God's power, each one expressing a different aspect of his, meaning Paul, understanding of the power of God. William Arndt et al. in their book, A Greek English Lexicon of the New Testament and other early Christian literature says, exceeding, which uh, in Greek is hyperbolo, means to go beyond surpassing. You find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, chapter 9, verse 14, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7, and chapter 3, verse 19. Greatness in Greek is megathos, means quality of exceeding a standard involving physical magnitude or size. And Henry George Liddell et al. in their book, A Greek English Lexicon, says power in Greek is dynamis, denotes the capacity to do anything, outward power, influence. The power of God is not some abstract concept. It defies explanation and can only be experienced by Romans 1, 16, 2 Corinthians 4, 7, Philippians 2, 13, 2 Thessalonians 1, 11. And working in Greek, in a gia, means the state or quality of being active, working 
Operation Action. It is the power of God that instills the people of God with the capacity to do the great work of missions and ministry. Matthew 25, 31 through 46, 28, 19, and 20. We experience God's power as we do the work of God. And sometimes we may wonder why, why our churches lack the power to effect change. It is because they are not doing the work of God. Paul says more about this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Verse 20 states that God's power was at work and visible in the raising of Jesus of Nazareth from the dead. Romans 6, 5-11 Philippians 3.10 And Curtis Vaughn said of the resurrection, it authenticated the Lord's ministry, sealed his redemptive work, marked the beginning of his glorification, and was a public attestation of the Father's acceptance of his sacrifice. And not only was Jesus raised from the dead, but after the ascension, he was seated at the right hand of God, which is a reference to Psalm 110, verse 1. Mark 14, 62, Acts 2, 34 through 36, Colossians 3. 1 and Hebrews 1 3 is where you'll find references to that. The heavenly places mean the location where God's sovereign rule over the universe takes place. And according to Ephesians 1 and 3, it is the place where the believer's spiritual blessings originate. Verses 21 through 23 are the expression of the pinnacle of the power and authority that God has invested in Jesus Christ. And he reigns supreme above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named. Paul summed up these words by saying every possible power and dominion in the universe have been conquered and defeated by Jesus Christ and there is no power greater than the power of God because he supersedes all others and is beyond all principalities, powers, might, and dominion. All things have been made subject to him, and he is the head of all things that pertain to the church. In Greek, it is ekklesia. Those who are called out one, are the called out ones. The power that God the Father has invested in Jesus is available to the church which is the living incarnation of Jesus in the world today. And the church is his body, a term often used by Paul to describe the organism of the church. The English word church comes from the Greek compound word ekklesia, ek meaning out and glacia meaning to call and refers to those who have been called out. Kevin Giles, in his book, What on Earth is the Church? An Explanation in New Testament Theology, helps us understand what the word ekklesia meant in Classical Greek. In Classical Greek, ekklesia, the word, was used 
of the citizens of the state in assembly. It was an abstract noun that spoke of those actually gathered. A note. One way to think about ecclesia is by comparing it to our Senate or Congress that gathers to enact laws for the country. God's ecclesia are those who have been gathered by God for his purposes. The Apostle Paul wrote that the church is made up of those whom God has called out of darkness. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellences of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, in the New American Standard, uh, from the New American Standard uh, Bible version. God has called us to be individual and corporate proclaimers of his goodness and mercy. Remember, every time we witness or talk about God's importance in our lives, we are witnessing. Some concluding thoughts. In our media age, we have access to multiple sources of information. Who or what can we trust as our source of wisdom? The opening prayer of Ephesians proclaims Christ as the ultimate source of hope and wisdom. This lesson provides many practical lessons that can be applied to our day-to-day -day activities as we seek to make a difference in the world. First, we are reminded that prayer is one of the principal responsibilities of every believer. Not only are we encouraged to use the Lord's Prayer as a model, but also Paul has provided an additional model. We pray for each other and for the work that God is doing in the lives of others. Through our prayers of thanksgiving, we encourage and inspire each other to do good works. Second, Paul has pointed to the great power of God, which is at work in the lives of all believers. The power that works in us is the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And third, we see that the church is the product of the intentional workings of God the Father. The church, which is the body of Christ, is not a standalone entity without any corresponding obligations to follow and obey Jesus Christ. The church is subject to Jesus Christ in everything. He is her head, meaning the church, and the one whose authority transcends all others. Great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. From to God be the glory. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, that you have chosen to show the fullness of your love through Jesus. We ask that your spirit continue to enlighten and guide us. Heavenly Father, we give you praise for indwelling us with your power. Grant that we may 
more readily serve your purpose and pursue those things that make our make for peace in our world. Forgive us of apathy and the unwillingness to always pray for one another. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.